We still do seven NUFC Matters show a week for free. But if you want to help support NUFC Matters, then there are a few ways of doing it. Hit the like button on each live broadcast and video. This helps the channel grow. Hit the subscribe button and select the all notifications bell so you don't miss a single show. If you want to help us financially, then you can join the channel using this button with the membership starting at $1.99 a month. Or you can drop us a donation in the chat using a super sticker. We're also looking for sponsors. If you'd like your brand advertised on the flies for the show and featured during the ad break, then email john at nufcmatters.com to arrange. Good evening and welcome to NUFC Matters with me, Steve Wraith. The jumper is on, the hair is cool, <laughs> dear is Ben Jacobs. How are you, Ben? Good evening, everybody. Yep, quite a good jumper today. Ted Baker of Ops My Game. No Harry Very Potter good. this week. <laughs> Fantastic. Good to have you on, mate. And as always, plenty of questions flying in uh, on social media and, of course, in the chat. Uh, we'll do our best to get through as many of them as we can in the next hour. A lot of people want to know about Joe Linton's contract. Luke Edwards in the uh, Telegraph put a story out uh, today that Joe Linton, um, well, it's almost done. Question for Ben. What have you heard about the Joe Linton contract renewal situation? Uh, is the news on Big Joe from a journal or is it from the club? Great news about Joe Linton's contract, says uh, B. Taylor. And uh, somebody else put uh, a thing in there. Benny, yeah. Great news about Joe Linton. Rumours that his earnings will increase from 85 grand a week now to something near what Bruno G is on, which allegedly is 160 grand a week. So, yeah, lots of chat about Joe Linton. You can see how much it means to the fans for him to sign on the dotted line. Yeah, there's a few things here. First of all, I think we should reiterate that the deal is close and that's my understanding so that's the good news and there's pretty much an agreement in principle in place at the moment so anything being discussed is only very minor and it's likely to be a four-year deal so that will take him through into his early 30s at the football club and I would expect Newcastle to have this one wrapped up in the month of April we wait and see when they choose to announce it of course but it's exactly what the fan base wanted to hear. They will obviously, as will Eddie Howe, want to make sure that there's no kind of speculation regarding outgoings for a player like Joe Linton, because we're going to hear that with Bruno Guimaraes, simply because there's a release clause. And in addition to that, there will be inevitable speculation against Alexander Isaac's name. And I would have thought Sven Botman as well. But the reality, and again, more good news for those two, is that I don't think Newcastle are planning for or wish to entertain any offers, even if financially they need to bring in some money from other areas. So the expectation is that Joe Linton, verbally at least, has agreed to a four-year deal. And I'm not so sure that the wages, as far as I'm told anyway, will quite be at the £160,000 a week mark, if that is even indeed the number that Bruno Guimaraes has committed to. Newcastle are conscious of both financial fair play and PSR rules. It will be over 100000 a week for sure, but I don't think it will be quite 
as high as that £160,000 a week number. And the reason for that is because whereas the player warrants being well compensated and one of the top earners at the club and has the advantage of being able to play in midfield or the front three, by the time you get into year number four of that contract, he's going to be 31 years of age. And I think that Newcastle will factor that in to any deal that they offer, knowing as well that if they qualify again for the Champions League or if other bonuses due to Newcastle United's success are activated, he can ultimately get to that number by earning that number like any other player. But base wage-wise, I'm told it's a little bit lower than the package that was offered to Bruno Guimaraes. So breaking the £100,000 a week marker but not making him, for example, the top earner at the club. Okay, that's interesting. We'll watch that uh, with interest. And uh, as I say, if you want to read more about that story, it was Luke Edwards who uh, broke the story in the Telegraph. Um, Widely reported um, that all we have to do is finish 15th or higher and we trigger the permanent hall transfer. His lack of game time earlier in the season was due to a lack of trust from the manager then, says Benny. Um, What have you heard on this uh, Lewis Hall thing? He's had a bit more game time, but that's more down to the fact that we uh, literally are uh, down to the bare bones at the back. Yeah, I don't think it's a lack of trust. Lewis Hall's a young player. He's developing. He's got a high ceiling. It's why Newcastle want to try and sign him, and they will. Ultimately, I think we can say that definitively, complete the signing. It's not 15th or above. It's above 15th, as far as I'm told. So that's actually 14th, and 15th doesn't trigger the clause. And by my maths, anyway, if Newcastle beat Spurs and Crystal Palace and Everton fail to win, then Newcastle are guaranteed 14th or better. So it may technically, mathematically speaking, be triggered now, but Everton, for example, can appeal their latest points deduction. And in addition to that, when it's paid is different to when it is mathematically triggered. And that's because who knows what could happen between now and the end of the season. Someone could field an ineligible player. More PSR charges could be levelled in theory. There could be a team that fails to turn up for a game or something. So when the math shows that Hall is a Newcastle player, we would still technically have to wait until the end of the season to make sure that there's no surprises. And the other thing I'm told, which is quite interesting in this, is that Newcastle may have structured the deal to actually receive the player now, but pay from after the PSR cutoff, which would be far, far more beneficial for Newcastle than it would be for Chelsea. So people are working on the presumption that it's just a lump sum triggered if Newcastle finished 14th or better into Chelsea's back pocket of profit but it may not actually go on the books within this financial year. So Chelsea may have to wait a further season and Newcastle may, according to multiple sources, have been able to structure the deal to benefit them, which means that their outlay actually won't start on this financial year because they'll make sure that the payment becomes due in July and not in June. And if that is the case and the structure of the deal, It's obviously very good news as far as Newcastle's finances are concerned and alleviating any fears regarding profit and sustainability. The other thing I'm told is that we hear a lot of numbers, right, as to what the package is. I'm told the guaranteed fee is 28 million minus 4 million paid already for a loan which contributes to that 28 million, which means that it's actually only 24 million due as the guaranteed fee, which is, again, more good news for Newcastle. Some people are reporting as high as 30. That's not my information. And then there are six or seven million in add-ons in addition to that that could be paid over time. So the total package might end up being somewhere in the region of 35 million quid, but the actual guaranteed fee is 28 million minus 4 million that's been paid which is quite smart really by Newcastle because it's very easy when you get a loan and you're not sure if it's going to become an obligation to establish a loan fee to make sure you can get it over the line and then worry about activating the rest of it 
later. But it sounds like Newcastle have effectively, if they obligate the Hall signing, got the loan part fee-wise for free because it ends up contributing to the overall guaranteed fee, which is another bit of good business as far as Newcastle are concerned. Why he hasn't played at left-back or why he didn't start immediately playing at left-back, I think it's just down to the fact that he also hadn't had that many minutes at Chelsea or opportunities, young player. And at the beginning of the season, we knew that there would be a chance to strengthen because of the whole Dan Burns situation. Maybe that was the one area, if we'd been really brutal with Newcastle before a ball was kicked and knowing that they had Champions League football, maybe that was the one area where we said, OK, they could definitely bring in a specialist left back. But I think to an extent, Burn was just given some game time and a little bit of loyalty and Hall was just given some time to bed in. But it was never minutes related or performance related that would trigger the obligation. So if Howard wanted to play Lewis Hall, running through his mind was not, I better be more cautious because we don't know if we want to keep him. Both Chelsea and Newcastle from day one have budgeted for Lewis Hall acquisition slash Lewis Hall sale because all parties knew from day one that it was very, very likely that the obligation would be triggered. And that's probably why Chelsea agreed to put the four million in loan fee towards the overall fee because everybody just accepted that the deal would get done and it will get done and it might get done as far as the maths are concerned anyway as early as this weekend okay a lot of people asking questions in the chat i think ben mainly covered the answers to that i was sticking them up on the strap line as well so uh, most people will have uh, will have seen them um okay a question for ben uh, from Tom Dixon. He says, with Everton getting a two-point deduction, do you think they'll get any more punishment? No more punishment. If anything, they'll appeal it and they might well get a point. Maybe both the points knocked off. It's interesting because I can understand both sides. The first thing is that we need a consistency of how these points deductions are calculated. And there's a model that gets you to the number as a starting point and that is consistent but then the end punishment is different depending on the three people on the commission and this is what Everton are arguing so you can very simply say okay you've made x amount of losses over the threshold therefore y is your points deduction and that can be ratioed to the amount of losses but that's only the starting point. And then what the independent commission do is they look at mitigating circumstances and every case is different. And Everton are basically arguing that Forrest were given more lenient mitigating circumstances than they were. And this is why the number of points deducted are different. Forrest, Everton would argue, should have six, but they don't. It's only four. And Everton have got two separate cases at 10 originally down to six and then obviously two on top. So the reason it's only two is because it started at five, again, using this pretty rigid formula to work out what the starting point was. And then Everton argued there were mitigating circumstances. And one of those amongst many was double punishment. You're basically punishing us twice for overlapping financial years. And if you've punished us for the first case, how can you consider the second year's for the second case as well. And they were successful in that. But the difference, which is quite interesting, is that Forrest were lauded for their exceptional cooperation and Everton were told that they did not exceptionally cooperate. And exceptional is the word within the ruling rather than my word. So if you own up early to a breach, share all of your documentation, admit culpability, and work with the Premier League, you get less of a punishment. And Everton are deemed to have cooperated less than Nottingham Forest. So their points deduction is more. And I think that it's going to be very difficult because my worry is that Forest and Everton now are bound to shout and scream and appeal and potentially drag this on beyond the end of the season. So we may get a farcical situation where we don't know where we stand at the end of the season. Everton might be down, but if they get their points back, then they're fine and Luton are the club that go down. And it could be the same for Forrest. 
And it would be a real shame if at the bottom of the table we're deciding relegation through lawyers rather than football. But that is unfortunately just the reality of where we're at at the moment. And I think it's going to be even harder if they change the rules this summer, whether that's luxury tax, which I think is unlikely. I've seen a couple of people asking about that or whether it's modeling it in a similar way to UEFA's squad control cost. Because if you suddenly scrap PSR, which remember everyone voted for, and if you scrap it this summer, then the clubs that have got points deductions, if it impacts their survival, are again going to come back and say, how is this fair? So I'm really worried we're going to get in a situation where instead of staying up on merit and instead of talking about football matches, we're going to constantly be talking about losses and points deductions and lawyers are going to decide ultimately who stays up and who goes down. Let's hope not. And in a weird way, as much as I love Luton and I think they've been brilliant, even in the games they've lost, they've had a real go. So if I'm using my heart, I'd love to see Luton stay up. But just to avoid this drama of PSR and lawyers and all this back and forth over who's been fairly judged, who hasn't been fairly judged, part of me just hopes that Forrest go and win three or four games, Everton go and win three or four games, points deduction becomes redundant, and then nobody can point the finger at the end of the season. Yeah, Jonathan Shaw says, they're making these rules up as they go along. How come Chelsea and Man City has taken so long? Uh, a couple of other people asked exactly the same question, mm. um, you know, ab about that. I'll uh, get to those questions now. Uh, ben, Blue Ribbon Boy says, how come Everton and Forest can get deductions quickly, but City and Chelsea have had nothing yet? And, um, yeah, Benny says, uh, question for Ben, do you think the Premier League are desperate for Forest and Everton to stay up, which is the point you were making there. Mm. You would like to see them win some games to avoid this, to avoid further legal challenges. Yeah, yeah I don't think Man, Man City cooperated as well, Benny says. Yeah, we'll come to Man City and Chelsea in a moment. Different cases, both of them. But the first point about the appeal, each team is given seven days to appeal after the ruling. And then there's a backstop on the appeal. And that takes us to, I believe, off the top of my head, one week after the season ends. So in a worst case scenario, Everton and Forest appeals will be heard seven days after the season. But there's a fair chance that the appeals will be fast-tracked and will be resolved between now and the end of the season. And then that's it. Everybody agrees that you can't, within the context of points deductions, appeal upon an appeal in this process. But the danger is that if Everton and Nottingham Forest go down, because of this points deduction, and then the rules change, or then they decide that they've been unfairly treated because there's a future precedent, like Leicester, my team, who have been charged by the Premier League. If anything in the future happens, retrospectively, the clubs might start a completely new case seeking compensation. And this is the problem with the nature of the process and this is where an independent regulator is going to have to clarify and be as transparent as possible because clubs don't really know where they stand. They don't really know what they're dealing with because it's the first time we've seen these points deductions and everyone's waiting for consistency and everyone's waiting for legal precedence. So the first sides to be dock points are treading new water, legally speaking. Um, if Leicester come up to the Premier League, for example, and get docked points in their first season back in the Premier League, Everton may argue the EFL should have had the jurisdiction for Leicester and they should have been docked points this season to stop them going up. If they're able to delay and stay under Premier League jurisdiction, which is not ideal either for Leicester, and be docked points for this last financial year next season, Everton could turn around and say, why are we not able to wait as well? Why are the points deductions not implemented on day one of the next season? Why can one points deduction be implemented 10 games in, one be implemented 20 games in, one be implemented 30 games in, and another side like Leicester... 
be able to wait and have it in the following season. And it's likely that it's because the Premier League have leveled the charges and Leicester in the EFL, but maybe the EFL should have jurisdiction over Leicester and the Premier League can't do anything at this point. So we go round and round and round with different permutations. And again, we're not talking about football. We're talking about lawyers and we're talking about PSR and we're boring everybody to death. With Man City and Chelsea, let's make one thing clear. Man City have been charged. Chelsea haven't been charged. Chelsea are still being investigated and are cooperating and will hope if they are charged that that cooperation with a new regime for potential charges, if they are leveled for Roman Abramovich, the cooperation will count as mitigation and will help them. And that's certainly the case with UEFA. Chelsea declared the instances they thought to be breaches with UEFA and they came to a settlement and they definitely won brownie points, if you like, and a more lenient punishment because they cooperated with UEFA. And maybe it will be the same with the Premier League if charges are levelled. We don't know yet. With Manchester City, I think we just have to distinguish. People always ask me the same question. Why is City not being resolved? And we knew about the 115 charges long before Everton and Forest. Everton and Forest is PSR. Yeah. Manchester City's charges are hundreds of other different things over many, many more years historically. So if Everton needs six to nine months for a handful of charges, then just do the maths and think how long it's going to take everybody to go through 115 charges. So it's just the scale and the history and the complexity of the city charges is completely different to current monitoring cycle charges regarding Everton and Forest. Nottingham Forest case is very simple. They went to the Premier League and they said, we wanted to sell Brennan Johnson to Brentford. He didn't want to go. We sold him to Spurs. We sold him too late to Spurs. If we were allowed to put that fee on our books earlier, we'd have been fine. And the Premier League said, we understand that, but that's your problem. Points deduction. We wait and see whether Forrest win any appeal because you can have a so-called near miss where if you really try and try and try and you're quite close to the financial year cutoff, you may get mitigating circumstances. But that really is just Brennan Johnson centric. And then with Nottingham, uh, with Everton, Everton argue that they're building a new stadium. There's no debate that new stadium related costs can be offset. So Tottenham, for example, have got big losses, but a lot are on their new stadium and they don't count towards the losses on the books of PSR. So Tottenham are fine, which is why they've not been charged. But Everton borrowed and borrowed and borrowed. And then from that money they've borrowed, they've had to pay it back with interest. And Everton argued that the interest payments that they've put back on their new stadium from loans they've taken shouldn't count as losses and the Premier League say they should. And with those losses, Everton are also over the threshold. So they're only actually looking at quite specific, singular or a handful of points. Whereas with Manchester City, there's thousands and thousands of things to debate within these 115 charges. And that's why we still don't have any resolution. And we might not still for potentially even up to three or five years. Last question on PSR, FFP, etc. Um, Tanya on Twitter sent me a, a message before saying, Hi, Steve, can you ask Ben, if Leicester managed to get promoted, how he thinks financial unfair play will hinder their <laughs> ability to stay in the division? Last time he spoke about clubs not following the rules on spending, hence why points were being deducted. In my opinion, they have no chance unless they do what Forrest did. Does he still think that it's a fair and even playing field when it comes to the rules? Good question, Tanya. Yeah, good question. I think as a fan of Leicester, I'm aware that the financial situation is a bit precarious. And even if they were okay within profit and sustainability, they still spent a lot of money on infrastructure, on a great training facility, on an expansion of the King Power Stadium. So finances are tight. And my issue with the 105 million of losses or whatever it becomes ratioed to if you drop down and come back up, because it's a smaller number then, is... When the market inflates as it has done so, the 105 million 
needs to adapt. And if it doesn't adapt, then you've got one fixed number and you've got a market that inflates and inflates and inflates. So you get to the point where if you want to buy anybody for the good of your team, for the good of staying up, suddenly a middle-of-the-road Premier League player is 20 million. And if you go back five years, a really good Premier League player was 20 million. If you go back 10 years, it would have been a club record. So we're getting to the point now where we're quite nonchalant about players being bargains if they're 35 million. Alexis McAllister to Liverpool, what a bargain at 35 million. But 35 million is a club record for Fulham. It's a club record for Leicester. It's a club record for Wolves. It's a club record for Luton. It's a club record for Burnley. So if probably half the Premier League see 35 million, which is allegedly a bargain, as a massive amount of money, and the 105 doesn't adapt to the inflated market, it's really difficult for clubs to sign the one or two players they need. So then what do you do? Do you sign what you need, like Forrest have done, like Leicester might have to do, and sign early, and then rely or pray on the fact that you've then got 365 days to offset what you've spent and you just pray and pray and pray that it's enough to keep you in the Premier League and then you work out the sales later down the line but that's very risky and Nottingham Forest did that and they've ended up getting punished or do you not buy anybody do you just come up with the squad that you've got but then look at Sheffield United and look at Burnley both of them are likely to go down so I think Leicester's challenge is that they may start, of course, with a points deduction. And even as a Leicester fan, I'd say, according to the rules, that may be fair because it happened to Everton, it happened to Forest. If the numbers say Leicester are over the allowable losses, if Leicester can't argue mitigating circumstances, then they do deserve a points deduction. If they can, then great. Let's wait and see what their legal argument is before prejudging it. And I remind everyone once again that the clubs voted for these rules. They've not been imposed upon the clubs. But it's just the fact that in that three years and beyond, the market's inflating much faster than this fixed number. So if we're to maintain profit and sustainability, there has to be more leeway. Otherwise, clubs are just not going to be able to afford the players that they want. And then the Premier League is going to start losing out to other leagues and nobody's going to benefit. I also don't think that the rules are so much unfair, because again, the clubs voted for them as just impractical, because the lower down the league you are within the Premier League, the more screwed you are by a small infraction of the rules, because that four points or six points or 10 points could cost you your place in the division. And then who knows, you may never come back up again. Whereas if West Ham get deducted 10 points, it's likely that they just finish mid-table. If Newcastle get deducted 10 points, it's likely that they stay up and go a bit higher and a bit higher, all the way up to Man City or Liverpool. If they get deducted 10 points, they're probably still in the Champions League. So it lends itself potentially towards the bigger clubs just saying, for us, we may as well breach the rules and take a few points deductions and a slap on the wrist and get who we need. But for the smaller clubs, they risk financial ruin or they just can't sign what they need to survive in the Premier League. So it's becoming lose-lose. The smaller clubs, I think, would argue, and the bigger clubs aren't that impacted, which is why none of them have been charged. Again, the Manchester City case is very different to what we're talking about. So I just hope going forwards that they adjust the amount you're allowed to lose maybe over five years, not three years, so you've got more time for sales, or maybe we remove the points deductions and we find another way of punishing clubs, or maybe we increase the allowable losses, but then there's a danger to that as well. It's all very well saying, well, now Newcastle can lose 200 million instead of 105 million, but is that sustainable? What if the clubs just spend it and then all go bust? So there's no easy solution here. The problem is not necessarily the rules. The problem is the market itself, which is inflating summer after summer after summer to the point where nobody can really afford to buy top-level footballers at the moment. And unless you're going to introduce a fee cap or unless you're going to introduce a wage cap, 
it's very difficult to see how things are going to change because I guarantee you in five years, in 10 years, prices and wages and agents fees are only going to get worse. Great stuff. Halfway through the show, time for the ads. A big thanks to all our sponsors, Skips and Bins. Go to their website, skipsandbins.com. Email inquiries at skipsandbins.com or telephone 0800 25 45 25 3. Easy contract free and pay as you go waste collection. Thanks to Mr. Vicky Sources, handmade in Cumbria. Go to their website, mrvickies.co.uk. Email info at mrvickies.co.uk or telephone 01768 210102. Thanks to United Group Travel. Go to their website, unitedgrouptravel.com. Email info at unitedgrouptravel.com or phone 01670 632 460 or mobile 0791 666 They're a local company from Morpeth and there are no strangers on our tours, just friends you haven't met yet. Big thanks to Media Arts for all the help with the video side of things. And if you want to subscribe to the channel, hit the subscribe button under the video. Click the thumb up to like the video and click share to share to your social media. If you want to help the channel financially, you can pay a one-off £25 fee. You get a cup, a scarf, a pen and a membership card and entry into the NUFC Matters monthly draw. Email john at nufcmatters.com for more details. Or if you've got a smartphone, scan the QR code now and it takes you straight to the membership pack. We also support the food bank on this channel. Go to nufcfansfoodbank.co.uk and you'll find the match day bucket. You can make a donation virtually today. You can also find us on iTunes, Spotify and other podcast providers. We also do events during the year. NUFC Matters Live will be at the O2 City Hall on Friday the 2nd of August for an evening with Rob Lee, one night in Antwerp. Tickets start at £15 and you can get them from Ticketmaster. .co.uk. An evening with the entertainers takes place on Friday the 24th of January 2025 at the Tyne Theatre and Opera House in Newcastle. Telephone 0844 249 1000 or visit the website Tyne Theatre and Opera House.uk to buy tickets today. You can also catch me on the Northeast Footy Breakfast Show live on Toon Radio weekdays 7 till 9 a.m. on DAB smart speakers and the two new care.com don't forget as well the end of season do at the irish center 20th of july in aid of dementia matters super matt and gibbo on stage george on stage and the uh, long sands as well tickets are tenor from newcastlelegends.com or nufcmatters.com and peter beardsley's at the irish center on the 2nd of june and tickets are available 19 pound on voucher for that event okay lots of questions coming in uh, as always psr and uh, fi financial fair players uh, taking over tonight's show but, um, <laughs> I do want to ask you about Dan Ashworth. I have had a couple of questions come in. I saw your social media post as well. Cameron McKay. Hi, Steve. Can you ask Ben what's the latest on Ashworth and who mm -hmm. is likely to be in situ for Newcastle for next season? And um, I did get another question about that as well. Somebody asking about the... Uh, uh, there it is, Spenny. Uh, evening, Ben. Is there any update on the director of football vacancy that we're going to potentially uh, appoint Maldini? Apparently, he was here last week and is interested in the position at Newcastle. I think that covers anybody else who was asking about Dan Ashworth. What's your views and what's, what have you heard? Yeah, I hear that Newcastle is still doing a relatively thorough search. I know a number of different names have been mentioned, including also Paul Mitchell and Phil Giles. I've heard a little bit on the Maldini front. He certainly is looking for his next challenge in football and even going back a little bit further, we know that Thiago Pinto was discussed a little bit by Newcastle as well. But I don't think that they fixed on a, a particular name just yet. Maybe that will change in the month of April because they're obviously going to want to bring someone in if they possibly can for the summer. And if they are in situ at another club, that, of course, is not easy. They'll be in the same position as Manchester United trying to get Ashworth a bit earlier. So not much progress yet on Newcastle's search for a sporting director other than whittling names down. And I think that we'll see some movement in April over the course of the coming weeks as far as formal interviews are concerned. I'm still told they're doing a process rather than just approaching a name they like and trying to get them. They will interview more than one candidate. And with Ashworth, 
He's obviously still on gardening leave. There's been no real progress between Newcastle and Manchester United yet. And I don't expect a great deal of progress until Newcastle have got a name locked in. And once Newcastle know who they're going to bring in, it's not necessarily going to be in their interest to keep paying Ashworth because then they have to budget for two sporting director wages over the course of the same months. And at that point, I would expect Newcastle's position to soften a little bit. I think it's very, very unlikely that Manchester United now will proceed with Ashworth for this summer. And that takes this 20 million number off the table. And Manchester United sources have always told me that they never intended to pay that amount anyway. So the fact that today John Mert has left Manchester United and Jason Wilcox is expected to be in imminently from Southampton it tells you probably that Manchester United are comfortable waiting for Ashworth. The priority, though, is not to have to wait for the full duration. So logically, a compromise is that he doesn't work this summer for Manchester United, but he starts at some point after the summer window, and then the compensation fee drops substantially. Now, Newcastle may say, well, substantial is 20 million to 10 million, and I still think that's a number that Manchester United won't pay. I'd be surprised if Manchester United offer anything above 5 million to get a sporting director because otherwise we're talking about player fees and it's near unprecedented for this position to be talking about the kind of fees associated with Ashworth. So if Manchester United have to wait, they'll wait, but it wouldn't surprise me once Newcastle have a sporting director lined up if they actually want Ashworth off the books because gardening leave does technically mean that he's pruning his backyard, but he's still getting his full wage from Newcastle United and they don't want that on the books with another sporting director, especially when budgets are tight. So I suspect the most logical conclusion is after Newcastle know that they're sorted with a sporting director, then they will allow a compromise where they take a more modest fee and perhaps Ashworth is in situ for the January 2025 window rather than having to see out the best part of 20 months for his full gardening leave. But I don't think we'll get much progress until Newcastle know who they want and have lined someone up first because I think Manchester United aren't going to hit the number Newcastle are asking for right now and I don't think Newcastle are going to reduce that number until they've got their own sporting director situation in control. OK, a uh, football-related question from Blue Rhythm Boy. Who does Ben think will win the Premier League? I still think it's going to be Man City. And where did you think Newcastle will finish in the table? I think Newcastle are going to finish seventh. And I think the uh, the bottom three at the moment, I've got to be perfectly honest, I think it'll be the bottom three um, that will finish bottom. But of course, as Ben's already alluded to, it could be decided in the courts, uh, depending on how these other teams go, <laughs> Everton and Forest in particular. But yeah, the question is, who do you think will win the Premier League? And where do you think Newcastle will finish in the league table? Yeah, I like the look of Newcastle's run-in, which might sound slightly strange to say because they've got to play Spurs and Manchester United. But the home games, I think they'll win, including Spurs this Saturday. And therefore, they'll beat Brighton, who may not have anything to play for by the time they arrive. And then the away games on paper are reasonably kind in the sense Burnley could even be relegated by the 4th of May. Crystal Palace are not in great form. It would be surprising if Newcastle don't beat Sheffield United at home as well. So it's all going to come down to me as to whether they can get a result away at Old Trafford in that rearranged game. And if they can, then who knows? They might sneak into sixth, but I kind of agree with you. Seventh or eighth seems more realistic. They've obviously got a game in hand over West Ham. They're eighth at the moment. I think they'll finish above Chelsea and I think they will finish above West Ham. So seventh at worst, sixth at best for Newcastle in terms of their finish. I think the, the bottom three that go down, unfortunately for Luton, will be the bottom three as of now. I'd love to see Luton stay up. I don't want to see it decided in a court of law. And then... I think it'll be Liverpool that win the Premier League. I sense that Arsenal, who because of their goal difference have got their fate in their own hand, will beat Bayern Munich. That's the good news if you happen to be an Arsenal fan. But by beating Bayern Munich, it means that they've got another two European games. And when you sandwich in between these European games, Bayern and then Villa, and then Bayern again, and then an away trip to Wolves, 
Then they've got to play Chelsea. Somewhere in that mix, there'll be another Champions League game. Then they've got a North London derby. And I just can't see them not dropping points in the league somewhere in that stretch. And remember, they've still got to go away at Old Trafford as well. When you compare that to Liverpool's run-in, even though they, of course, are still in Europe as well, I don't see Liverpool dropping any points at Anfield, especially not with each game becoming more and more and more sentimental. I don't think away at Everton and a Merseyside derby is particularly difficult. I don't even think home to Spurs is particularly hard. The only game I would worry for them to a degree is their away trip to Aston Villa in early May. But if by that point they've got their fate in their own hands because Arsenal are dropping points, it wouldn't surprise me if Liverpool actually barely drop any points. Maybe they don't even drop any points between now and the end of the season. And that means however good Manchester City are, they won't be able to catch Liverpool. It's going to go down to the final game of the season. But I think come that final game of the season, it will be in Liverpool's hands. And I've just got a sneaky feeling that it will be Liverpool 1, Man City 2, Arsenal 3. Interesting. It's all about opinions. Um, I tell you what, it's Everton's running really in, intrigues me. They've got to play everybody around them. It's going to be mm. a fascinating run in that. And if they if they hit the jittery uh, slope in that last uh, bit of running, uh, could be could be interesting. And I think it's Everton Sheffield United, the final game of the season. Imagine having a Sheffield will be Sheffield will be down, nothing to play for. And I remember Newcastle playing Spurs at St James's Park, relegated, nothing to play for, all the worries of the world off your back. And we mm. walked Spurs 5 1 that game. So you never <laughs> know. You never know. Um, other football questions um, was one was from Spenny, actually. He texted us it earlier, and I've just remembered he texted me this. Um, it's about the goalkeepers. Do you think Newcastle should be chasing a goalkeeper? Two goalkeepers probably out the door. Dubravka's getting on. Um, what's your thoughts on the goalkeeper situation? Nick Pope coming back from a, a really bad shoulder dislocation, second time he's done it to the same arm. Is, is, is a goalkeeper a priority for Newcastle in this window as well? Yeah, it could be, but they've missed Nick Pope when he comes back. We know that they've got a number one. And then Eddie Howe's been very clear on Dubravka that he really likes and rates him. I don't really understand why we hear links with Newcastle and too many goalkeepers, because a lot of the goalkeepers that are being linked are looking to be number one. And Nick Pope is Newcastle's number one. And if he's fit, it's as simple as that. So when people talk about... Aaron Ramsdale, he's not moving to Newcastle as a number two at the moment at Arsenal to challenge Nick Pope and be a number two at Newcastle. So if they're going to bring in a goalkeeper, they're going to bring in a young goalkeeper that's less known and they're going to bring in a goalkeeper that plays behind Nick Pope. And that takes a lot of the names that are linked out of the equation. And I still think that Eddie Howe is very comfortable with Dubravka, at least as his number two. And everybody knows that Nick Pope fit is an outstanding number one. So I don't think the goalkeeper will be a massive priority, but it wouldn't surprise me if they find someone young. Remember, the other thing is that the new sporting director is going to have new ideas. So until they come in, it's very difficult to firm up Newcastle's summer plans. And this is why they'll want to make sure they get a name in sooner rather than later. And I think the other thing, by the way, I was going to say, just on goalkeepers, which is quite interesting, is that, I think in that game that you were talking about, the 5-1, it was Darlow in goal. <laughs> and I can't remember exactly any Newcastle lineup because we're, we're probably talking about eight, nine years ago when that 5-1 is. But it sort of just struck me when you asked the goalkeeper question after talking about that game and y you look at how they've changed, it just shows you this new wave and that game was memorable, of course. And there were certain players, by the way, that perhaps were underrated at Newcastle that have grown into their prime. But from memory, that's the kind of game where Darlow would have been the goalkeeper for sure. I would have thought that Taylor would have been in that starting eleven. Dummett would have been at the club. Wijnaldum was probably playing for the club. Sissoko was probably there. I would have thought Colback was probably there. And I think from memory, it was a game where we saw it, actually. Somebody flashed it up in the comments where Mitrovic got sent off as well. And then within that Newcastle squad, you would have had Aarons, who I think actually got a goal in that game. You would have had Seem de Jong, Jose Perez, of course, Leicester legend, somebody like Freddie Woodman as well. So flashing forwards now to the quality and depth that Newcastle have got, 
it's an incredible transformation. And uh, yeah, that here's game the, was here's memorable. The team. Here's the team. It was 4-2-3-1. Rafa was manager. Darlow, Jan Matt, and Bemba, Taylor, um, Dummett, Colback, Teoti, God bless him, uh, Townsend, Wijnaldum, Sissoko, and Mitrovic. Subs that weren't used, Woodman, Cissé, De Jong, and Perez. And uh, subs that did come on, Jamie Sterry uh, and John Joe Shelby. Um, bookings, Teoti, sent off, Mitrovic. Goals for Wijnaldum, uh, 19th and 74th minute. One of them was a penalty. Mitrovic did score. Aaron's and Daryl Janmark got a goal as well. Wow. That's crazy. It is. I mean, it? you know, it's, it's obvious that everybody changes. I mean, Spurs had Lloris and Kane um, and Ericsson, no doubt. So you expect change. But I think the point I'm making is that at their peak, if you're Tottenham now, would you have Lloris in goal over Vicario at their peak? I point out. Yeah, you absolutely would. You'd probably have the Tongan. You'd definitely have Walker. You would definitely have Ericsson at the peak in this Spurs side. You'd definitely have Son and you definitely have Kate. So the, the six, seven, eight players in that Spurs team that played Newcastle that you take, which means that like for like, if that Spurs team played the Spurs team now, I think it'd be a coin toss who won. Whereas if that Newcastle team played the Newcastle team now, there'd only be one winner and it wouldn't be the 2016 side. It's a good point to make that, actually. Good point to make. Um, Minty, Craig Lee's question. Uh, what's your thoughts on Yankuba Minty? Ten goals he scored, nine in the league, one in the Champions League. He got a brace in the big derby at the weekend in the 6-0 win. Um, will he stay or will he go? Do you think he'll go back out and loan or do you think Newcastle might take a chance on him and uh, keep a hold of him next season? Yeah, it wouldn't surprise me if there's another loan only because if you don't go out on loan and you've not got multi-club within the Newcastle model at the moment, then you've got somebody that will only turn 20 over the summer. And I think in wide areas, Newcastle is still relatively well stocked. So I think the plan is that He'll do the preseason with Newcastle and he'll get minutes and game time and then they'll make a judgment call on it. But there's definitely an openness to one more loan spell on the player side. It's just up to Newcastle to try and determine it. And as you rightly say, he's doing excellent at the moment. I think it's now 10 goals in all competitions in the Eredivisie with Feyenoord. And he's also won three or four caps for Gambia. So there's a lot of experience there, which will set him up in good stead. But my sense at his age is that coming back to Newcastle won't give him enough minutes to further develop. And Feyenoord are absolutely keen on another loan, and that's no real surprise. But there's several other clubs, I'm told, that are looking. There's been inquiries from the championship, but I think what you'll find is that Newcastle would like to send him somewhere if they possibly can, if they choose to loan him out with European football. And I, I know, for example, that Real Betis and Union Berlin are two clubs that have been tracking him with the possibility of a loan as well. So let's wait and see what Newcastle do. I don't think anything is determined, but just logically, if you're picking your starting eleven for next season, regardless of his goals and form at the moment, it's quite hard to see him in it. So Eddie Howe's going to have to determine, is it better to keep him with the squad, see him five days a week in training, get him a few starts and some cameos from the bench, or have him playing every week for one more season and then bring him back to the club permanently when he's 21 years of age. And I think the jury's out. Like Normal protocol, if you just look historically at what Newcastle have done and other clubs have done, two loans is very normal as opposed to only one, unless the player really breaks through and is indisputably of Premier League quality. So I think Newcastle will just assess over the summer, but it wouldn't surprise me if they loan him out one more time and even try and get him some European experience. And that might be Feyenoord once again. It could be at a club like Betis or Union, or potentially they just take a gamble and keep him with the squad. It's up to how, but nothing is set in stone at the time we're speaking. 
Yeah, people asking what game I'm watching tonight. I'm going to watch Leeds versus Sunderland. Uh, the Champions League games don't appeal to me. We're not in it anymore. And um, it, it would just be a case of what might it might have been for me. Uh, I've got to be honest. So uh, I'd rather avoid the Champions League. I'll watch the final, of course. Uh, hmm. Martin C says, Ben, any idea where Benzema is heading to now that he's unsettled? We'll see. It could still be within Saudi Arabia or alternatively, if he does come back to Europe, someone's got to be able to afford those wages. We heard these rumours of a rare return. There was nothing in that. There was nothing in the Chelsea links either. So it's going to be up to Benzema to set his terms if he wants to leave Saudi Arabia, because obviously there's very few people out there that can afford his wages. Leon were the club through John Textor, who of course is also linked to Crystal Palace. They were the one that tried to bring Benzema back. Leon, his boyhood club, or one of his youth and boyhood clubs, his first senior team. So that would be a sentimental return. But it just doesn't make any sense on paper, given what Benzema currently earns and given Leon's position at the moment, because they're likely to finish mid-table in League One. They can potentially, with a big push, get some kind of European football, but they're 10th at the moment in the table. So they're not going to have any European football next season. That's going to impact their income. And unless Benzema says, I basically want to pay my own way almost and take a huge cut, I can't see that one happening. The Chelsea links were very much overblown during the last window as well. So the first thing Benzema is going to do is actually speak to Alitiad. He's not happy but if the right recruitment happens, it's not impossible he just stays there. And if he does go, deal makers that I speak to within Saudi Arabia and sources close to Benzema say they'd love to find another solution. Maybe he goes to Al Hilal or to Al Nasser. Or as I said before, maybe Al Ittihad push for Mo Salah and then Benzema becomes content. So he's not necessarily desperately unhappy in Saudi Arabia. He's just very unhappy specifically at Al Ittihad. So I wouldn't rule out him staying within Saudi Arabia. Uh, but if he is to leave, it won't be back to Real. It's a stretch to get him back to Lyon financially. And anybody else that wants Benzema has got to afford his wages. I know some people will say, well, can't he just be loaned to Newcastle? And then can't Al Ittihad... PIF to PIF, just front the difference in the wages. That's not something I'm told has been discussed, and it's not something that Eddie Howe is considering. And remember the other thing, that by the time we get into next season, 36-year-old Benzema is going to be turning 37. It may well be that he's not up to the pace and the level of the Premier League anyway, and might consider something outside of Europe, such as MLS. That could also be a possibility for him. A lot of people asked early on um, about the new changes. Uh, Lee's South says, luxury tax, Ben. Uh, what are your thoughts on that? Uh, any George George asked, what does Ben think will be the outcome of the changes in PSR and FFP? David Cook said, Ben, what can you tell us about the new proposals for PSR and how changes can be aligned with UEFA rules? Uh, lots of people want to know about that. And Stephen Adams just says, mm -hmm. do you think luxury tax is a non-starter, Ben? Yeah, luxury tax is a non-starter for me just because it doesn't marry with financial fair play and there has to be a mirroring in many ways to keep things simple between FFP and profit and sustainability. So financial fair play is not going to change massively. The new pillars have already come in and in terms of the actual requirements are phased in and what the Premier League is more likely to do rather than luxury tax is to align its rules with UEFA's introduction of new squad cost controls and squad cost controls basically limit spending on wages and transfer fees to 70% of a club's revenue for the teams that are obviously competing in European competition. And the Premier League don't have to, if they do move in this direction, keep it at 70. They could say it's 75 or 80, or they could have a lower number. Or alternatively, they could keep the UEFA number of 70%. And they then might consider some kind of financial-based punishment, which could be construed as a form of luxury tax if teams go over. But the downside of squad cost controls, even though Newcastle will probably be somewhere in the middle, is just it's obviously going to benefit the bigger clubs because the more revenue you bring in, the more money you've got to spend and the less revenue you bring in, the less money you've got to spend. So the danger of changing the rules this way 
I think is getting two thirds approval. And remember, it's not majority. It's a in inverted commas, super majority. It has to be two thirds majority if they vote it in, not just a majority. So not 11 against nine. And that's significant because if it was only a majority, the big six, or if we include Newcastle, even the big seven, can basically influence the vote. Whereas two thirds mean a lot of the medium and smaller clubs have to be on board as well. And I just wonder whether if it's ratioed according to what you bring in, if some of the smaller clubs, particularly those that have oscillated between Premier League and Championship, might say this is ridiculous. Because what prayer does a newly promoted club have of competing anywhere near what a big six club has if you're measuring them in terms of what they can spend against the revenue that they bring in? So it's tough because there's no one size fits all. But I think that it's going to be a lot easier to mirror what UEFA do rather than introduce a luxury tax. Yeah, I think that just uh, that covers it. Somebody asked a question about that as well. Didn't understand the voting and how it has to come to that uh, and how it comes that way. Any deals uh, between Newcastle and Saudi clubs in the pipeline? I mean, we'll have you on over the summer, Ben. We, mm -hmm. we love having you on the show usually once a week just to dispel a few of the rumours and myths. But um, do you think Newcastle will do business with, with a Saudi club? Uh, this summer there should be some business done, I think. Yeah, I think so. But I don't think it'll necessarily be Newcastle signing from a Saudi club. I think it'll be the other way around. It wouldn't surprise me if you look at the case of a player like Minter, there might be some Saudi interest because the Saudi quotas are changing this summer from eight foreign players of any age to 10 foreign players allowed per squad, eight of which can be any age and two of which need to be born in 2003 or later. So it's an opportunity not just for Saudi to sign names, but it's actually a window now with the new quotas where Saudi clubs may want young talent they know that they can't buy, but they're prepared to take them like a straight loan for a year because it's high profile to get some of the best young talents in the world whilst they're still developing. So there may be scope for Newcastle to send some of their young stars out to Saudi. And obviously that can make Newcastle loan fee money and give players minutes and then there'll always be one or two older players naturally that are in demand that potentially depart Newcastle. And as any player gets into their early 30s, you may find that there's a little bit of interest from Saudi Arabia. I'm not that aware of anything concrete compared to, say, Manchester United, where clubs are looking at Casemiro, clubs are looking at Rafael Varane. Obviously, we know about Mo Salah and Thiago Alcantara at Liverpool, and they're also being looked at as well. But who's to say that a Saudi club won't say, what about a Martin Dubravka? Or why not try for uh, one of Newcastle's other slightly more ageing stars? It's just whether these players have a desire to go over there. Um, and, you know, one of the downsides of doing business with Saudi, if you've just got an older name that perhaps isn't quite as high profile is because of the quotas. They don't just want an older name, they want a star name. And if they can't get a star name, they won't necessarily just take the older name. They'll say, we'll, we'll get someone in their mid or late 20s. And those are the kind of players that Newcastle won't want to um, necessarily get rid of. So, you know, would Saudi want a Jacob Murphy? Uh, well, well, of course, he could do an absolutely brilliant job playing at that level. But are they going to eat up a quota spot with a player like him? Or are they only really looking for globally known names? I think the one to watch is still Miggy Almiron. Uh, I know the player didn't want to go, and that was what scuppered that deal. But make no mistake about it, even if in hindsight the narrative is rewritten a little bit, Al-Shabaab and Newcastle absolutely had a verbal agreement for €30 million. Euros, and even Eddie Howe, uh, refused to downplay that. So, you know, in hindsight, you're always going to say we never wanted to lose the player because you don't want to unsettle things when a deal doesn't come off. But that was all, to my knowledge, pretty much agreed between the two clubs. And as normal for Saudi deals, you go to the player camp last after you've agreed a deal on the club side. That just happens. It's just the slightly atypical way that they do business. And when they went to Almiron, he didn't want to go. Is his mind going to be changed this summer? I'm not so sure. Are Saudi going to try again? 
very possibly. And it might not be Al-Shabaab. It might be one of the PIF-controlled clubs. So it's worth watching because I think Newcastle are going to need to sell somebody. And I still think they feel that they can get 20, 25 million for a player like Almiron. And that could be the difference between being comfortable within PSR or moving a little bit in the market or having to be uncomfortable and potentially having to entertain offers or sweat that somebody is going to trigger the release clause for a player like Bruno Guimaraes. Great show as always, Ben. Thanks for your time. We will hopefully catch up in the next week or two. Uh, have a good weekend and uh, we will see you next time. Thanks, Ben. All the best, everyone. Have a good week. Enjoy the Champions League or the Championship, depending on what you're watching. Good luck, Alastair. Take care, man. <laughs> Cheers.